Um, my name is Sarah Bobman. I'm um, co-hosting the session with Frank today to introduce to you Heather Green, who is visiting CFPR this week. She's Associate Professor of Printmaking and Book Arts at Arizona State University, and she's currently in the UK as a Fulbright Scholar with Cardiff University. So Heather's going to talk to you a bit today about her current project with geographer Wayne Jones. So over to you, Heather. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk to you and share this project. Um, I'm really excited to see the campus here and meet Sarah and everybody. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop my video so that I'm not distracted by the that screen here and just talk to you about the um, project. So um, just as a um, introduction, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about myself and where I'm from so that you understand kind of how this project originated. Um, so I am from Tucson, Arizona originally, and um, to kind of give you a little bit of a, um, uh oh, let's see, hold on here, a little bit of a um, background for those of you who may not know. Um, Tucson, Arizona is in um, the southern southwest part of the United States, and my family um, has a little cabin that my grandpa built in the early 60s in a place called Choya Bay that's in the south end of Bahia Adair in the Gulf of California in Mexico. So you can see it's kind of close to Tucson. In the US standards, it's about a four hour drive. <laughs> so that's the closest ocean to the desert of Arizona. Um, and that is the area that my project is examining. Here's another view of it. Um, and again, just to give you a little bit of a background, this is Choya Bay, where my family's cabin is. But this whole, um, oops, that whole bay there, that little divot is Bahia Adair. And um, th the project originated because um, I've been going to this place my whole life and I'm kind of in love with it. Um, but north of that little peninsula of Choya Bay is private Bajito land. And it's pretty, it's a very uh, large tidal area. So it has the third largest tide in North America. And so my whole life I've wondered what's north of there, but I've never known what it was because it's private and it's remote. There aren't any establishments really along it um, or it's dangerous. So I had this idea that it would be really great to sort of explore that area. Here's another view of the little peninsula a long time ago showing this little estuary right here. Um, and another view of where my family's cabin was still is but doesn't look like this anymore photographs from my grandparents from the early 60s um and what happened was that over time while i was living away um they built a golf course in the estuary and destroyed it and had even further plans to turn the peninsula into an island um and this all happened while I was in my 20s living away. Um, so when I came back to Tucson, I decided to get involved with this organization called SEDO, the Center for the Study of Deserts and Oceans, um, and do whatever I could to help them and to try and fight off this, these developments and learn as much as I could about, um, about the area, doing museum exhibits and graphic design and anything that they could do. It's kind of a really great little organization that has a research station that's right on the beach. Um, and it's really the only environmental organization in the area. And in the process of working with them over, I don't know, 15 years or so, I met a lot of scientists and learned tons and tons about the area. Um, and it just really kind of fueled my art in a major way. These are some drawings from um, from a research um, from a research book by um, geographer Carl Flessa, who studied the tidal flats of Choya Bay, mostly in the seventies and eighties. 
But these drawings really influenced me and kind of gave me the idea to do these plaster casts of the mud flats. Um, and the other thing that really influenced me in his work was these diagrams that he has that are th these incredible <laughs> detailed um, descriptions of every single type of mud ripple that there is and the, the names for them and little drawings of them and the pages just go on and on. Um, so I decided to do a project examining the mudflats and really looking at um, what happens when the tide goes out. Because um, in this particular bay, when the tide goes out, you can walk all the way out because it's um, very firm underfoot, unlike the mudflats here. Um, and so you can walk out for hours until you find the sea again. And there was some kind of adventure for exploring the very edges of that area that you know is usually covered up in water and then making these mudflat casts in those areas um so that's kind of how my project started but then i thought it might be really interesting to um expand the project and also look at other tidal areas in other parts of the world and in the in the process of researching tides, I came across the writing of geographer Owen Jones, who's an emeritus professor of Bass Spa University, and who's here today in the audience, um, and decided to ask him, because his writing was so amazing, um, uh, if he would be interested in collaborating and doing a project where we were really examining the two project, the two landscapes together. So Bahia Adair, where I am so familiar with and the Severn Estuary, which of course you probably all know is the second or third largest tide in the world. Um, but the interesting thing for me personally about it is that Owen, it turns out, grew up on the estuary and on the Welsh side on a farm that was destroyed for, um, re you know, they reclaimed some of it for housing and for um, a landfill. And as you just learned, I learned, I lost an estuary to a golf course. So we sort of had that in common and it just kind of made a really nice, I don't know, place for examining and thinking about looking at each other's landscapes and how much we each love them. So it's very exciting to me to meet someone who loves their place as much as I love mine. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of shooting from the hip here, just sharing some images with you as we go. This is one of the early uh, pictures of me making the cast out in the field. Um, the, the first ones were made with a wooden frame, which didn't work very well. But I use an alginate material to do the mold making so that hopefully I don't harm any animals and it sets off really quickly. So even if the tide's coming in, you can work pretty fast. Um, so that's an, an image on the right of one of the newer ones that now I use a metal frame. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up hiring a fisherman in Mexico to help me um, get to all of these remote places in the, in the north part of the bay, either by four wheel drive or by boat. Um, and so it was a real adventure for me to go out and seek these places out and see if I could find a dry enough place to do the casting. And, um, and in the process really became friends with him and his family, which was really fun. He invited people to come along every time and eventually get different, um, different casts from all these different points around the entire bay. So I was trying to really do sort of a survey showing diversity of patterns in the mud, but also non-human creatures and scripts and that look like writing and language to me in the mud. Um, and that's a picture there in the middle of um, his daughter who he brought along sometimes. So that was really fun. And then of course, sometimes we ran into some obstacles <laughs> that we got stuck in the mud as the tide was coming in and it took a couple hours to get out. That was interesting. <laughs> um, here's some more pictures, it's very beautiful there. A very, very different landscape because it's a desert and an ocean. Um, and there's Ernesto, the fisherman, who we worked, who I worked with for basically two years doing these casts. 
And I've also collaborated with a musician friend, Michael Henderson, who um, is in the process of recording. He built a hydrophone and he's recorded all of these animals underwater. Um, and he's going to overlay it with um, ambient soundscape to try and capture all of these different data sets about the tide and then hopefully do the same thing here. Um, and here's some more images of the landscape, some of the different estuaries. The estuaries in Bahia Adair are different than they are here. They are not fed from a river. They're negative estuaries, they're called. So they're just backflow from the tide as the tide comes in and they become hypersaline, so super salty, but they still function as a normal estuary, um, becoming nursery for lots of fish and important habitat for birds, of course. And also Bahia Adair, right on the fringes of the coast, there are several different um, salt flats. And so I've cast a couple of those too, and that's what that image is on the left. Um, and here's a picture of the whole bay, and those are all of the places that I made casts, including the salt flats on the fringes. And that Astero Las Lisas, that area was too dangerous to get into, although you never know, I might still try and do that, because there's a lot of sandbars and kind of really extreme tidal flats in that area. So... That's the project for the um, the research. And then this is what I've got so far. So you can see the diversity of plaster casts. And then I've created um, several different artist books. And so far, just this one that's shown here is finished, which I have with me today to share with you. Um, and what I did was every three minutes for an hour and 45 minutes, roughly, I photographed the exact same spot as it, the tide was coming in. So it sort of documents time and space. Um, and at the end of the hour and 45 minutes, the water was about 12 feet deep. And those are just photographic images in an accordion book. And here's all of the casts from Bahia Adair. This one shows um, rain marks, pock marks from rain, and a little dead crab. The salt flat. And then these are some details of that book. But in addition to this book, the actual major bulk of the project is in this ethnographic um, book that is almost done for Bahia Adair. That includes an A to Z lexicon and a series of vignettes written by myself and a fisherman that I interviewed. And I'm still hoping to maybe also get someone from the Tohono O'odham tribe that used to do pilgrimages to the area to collect salt and shells. Um, this, these are images of um, some hand-printed letterpress and photopolymer imagery on handmade paper. I was just experimenting with how I might want to create this book. So it's kind of a dummy um, just for imagery alone. And I also have this with me. Um, but the design of the book has changed a little bit since, since this. Um, these are the childhood sort of vignettes written by myself and Rafael Machuca, who's a fisherman. So there's they're sort of poetic, just little glimpses into memories about the places that have disappeared. For me, it's really about the estuary. And for him, it's about um, his experience fishing with his dad in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So it's really important to me that this book is um, polyvocal and really 
expresses not just my memories and my knowledge, but other people, all the scientists that I've worked with, fishermen, other American people who have experienced this place. Um, and through my friendship with Owen, I have learned about the methodology of deep mapping and um, have really embraced this in this project in a in a big way. Um, so really looking at everything that makes this place special and distinctive and unique. And so here's some imagery of a dummy of the book. Again, the A to Z lexicon, including place names and people and lots of non-human creatures, which I've really tried to make sure that I give pronouns to properly so they're never called its. Um, and then in the margins, I'm hoping to have even more um, little margin notes that will be other people's thoughts and comments about what I've written about, because I'm not an expert um, in everything about this place. But in the process of trying to write this, I've learned a lot, and it's been kind of an amazing experience for me. So again, I've brought these dummies along to show you, but just to give you an idea of what this book is going to sort of be like. So the idea is that it'll be English on one side in a do -si do um, but a three-way do -si do book. In the middle will be these snail scripts sort of showing the movement that look a lot like language and cursive writing to me. Um, so these are pygmy olive snails in Bahia Adair. And I didn't I didn't fake these. These were just some of the ones I was able to capture. <laughs> so, so this is going to be in the middle. And then you flip it for the second side, and it'll be in Spanish. So that way, between the three books, there's no hierarchy. And I can really kind of make the human and the non-human, the English and the Spanish equally as um, important, hopefully. And so the plan is eventually to have the those books on a table in the middle of the room and have to have the audience peruse those with all of the casts and the soundscape and and everything else. And then while I'm here, my project is to do the exact same project about the Severn Estuary, which you see here on the slide. Um, but instead of it being in English and Spanish, it'll be English and Welsh. Um, so I'm I'm based out of Cardiff University for the Fulbright, which is wonderful because they can help me with a lot of that sort of thing. And the Severn Estuary Partnership is housed there. Um, and then on the English side of the estuary, I'm working with Owen and um, kind of working up and down the coast to make mudflat casts and to do all the ethnographic research. So it's a big project and I'm only here through July so I don't know if it's going to be enough time to do everything, but it'll be a good start. And then I can finish things up while I'm away and come back when it's done. These are just some images um, comparing some of the mudflat textures between the Severn Estuary and Bahia Adair. Just, just some um, a way of sort of thinking about the two places together. So Owen has taken the picture on the left of the Severn and you saw the one on the right already of Bahia Adair. And so it's fun. It's fun to compare and think about them. I was able to capture an octopus making these incredible scripts, which was amazing. Unfortunately, the tide came in too quickly. I couldn't cast it, but that was kind of incredible. And then on the left, um, those are some scripts possibly from birds that Owen captured. Some Google Earth images of Bahia Adair and the Severn. And then there's a lot of really interesting observations that I've been having so far. Being here, you know, as I described, part of my motivation initially in doing the project was so that I could explore the farthest reaches of Bahia Adair when the tide was out, because you can just easily walk all the way across for, for you know, hours. But what I'm realizing being here now for a few months is that the 
the really exciting thing here isn't the low tide because it's so dangerous to go out there. Um, it's the high tide, I think, that's so exciting here with the boar and the force of the tide and just everything about the culture here. Um, but also the fact that it's been, unlike Bahia Adair, it's been heavily civilized for centuries and centuries and it has such a rich history from the recent you know history of the mud horse sled that you see here to you know prehistoric footprints and um all the villages and fishing methods and um just everything so i think the severn estuary lexicon is going to be about 10 times longer at least <laughs> than bahia adair um and you know, I'm hoping that by comparing the two landscapes and looking at these books together on the same table, that it'll bring awareness to um, the importance of estuaries and how vulnerable they are in climate change and with overfishing and all of the taxing things that are facing these landscapes now, but also just how magical tidal landscapes are and how lucky we are to live near them. You know, these are here's an image of um, the tidal barrage. I know there's a lot of threats here that would really affect a lot of fish and birds and wildlife. And in Bahia Adair, there's problems with the seawater level getting um, a lot warmer and bleaching, colonizing um, animals. These are anemones and sponges that have been bleaching in the last few years, which is really worrisome. The golf course. So, I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of things about them that we need to remember. And I think because they're such flat landscapes and they're so muddy landscapes, I think they're also underappreciated and misunderstood. So I'm hoping that by comparing these places and working with Owen on learning about this amazing place with the incredible history um, that I'll learn a lot and I'll share a lot and um, yeah, makes um, some impact with, with raising awareness for these things. So that's it. Um, Thank you. That was really fascinating talk. Amazing. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So I've got one already. Um, if people want to ask questions, then please pop them in the chat. Um, so I've got one here that says, what What did you take from your interviews with the fishermen and what were you hoping to learn? Um, well, I asked... I asked um, I asked Raphael to talk about his history with the tides in particular, because I'm working with tides as a way of sort of framing this. Of course, there's a lot of things besides the tides that are amazing about these landscapes. Um, and so, I don't know, I was really open about how he how he would answer and I recorded him. What, what we did was we met first, I recorded our conversation and then he went away and um, wrote me, I don't know, something like six pages of memories. And he said, here you are. <laughs> and I just broke them down into the same kind of length of memories as the ones I wrote so that they could go together and be in the same number. But it, it literally was that sort of easy to work with him. He was really great that way. Um, and what am I hoping to learn? Um, I just feel like the landscape, at least in Bahia Adair, is one where there are American tourists that come down there and build really fancy, ritzy, I call them McMansion, sort of tacky <laughs> looking huge houses. And then there's a, lot, there's a lot of local people that live a very different lifestyle. And I don't think I would call them poor necessarily, but some of them are very poor. Um, and I just think there's a big, a big divide. And so by bringing awareness to 
I don't know, by sharing the stage with with a fisherman, um, I'm learning about their life, but I'm also um, um, sort of painting a portrait more completely of everybody that lives in this landscape. Thank you. Oh, we've got more coming in. Um, do you have any further plans to work with the actual water of the tide rather than what is left or what is left, or, sorry, or is what is left more important in your practice? Um, well, with the Mexican part of the project, the palimpsests that are left in the mudflats are so interesting to me because they are just a snapshot in time and they're very ephemeral and the fact that the tide comes in and erases them and that it's done twice a day um, is sort of incredible to me. So those traces are what's really interesting to me, but also I, I'm interested in the what's left in the mud, I guess also because it's sort of evidenced of, you know, the non-human entanglements and the um, all of the creatures that visit the place. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in that part of it, I guess. Although I know that the, the force of the water itself is amazing. And of course the water is beautiful and helps to shape the mud, but that's, <laughs> Um, one more. Um, so from your experience, do you have any advice or kind of top tips for students or artists working with environmental interests or issues? Um, do I have any advice for in general or? Yeah, for artists who or maybe students or people who are just starting to work um you know, obviously loads of people have environmental concerns or interested in ecologies. And are there any things that kind of on reflection you think, oh, I wish I'd known that or, um, mm. oh, that was a really good tip that someone gave me of kind of that relationship of being out there working in the environment. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say that I think that having some, really getting to know a place, if there's a place that you really love, um, and really diving really deep into it, I think is a really humbling, a humbling experience because you can't ever know everything about a place, even if it's really tiny, like the place in Mexico that I, I know so well. Um, and there's something kind of beautiful about just um, knowing that you'll, there's, there's always more, you know, even a place that's been so heavily changed and altered um, thank yeah, you. I don't know if that yeah. answers the question. That, that would be my scientists. Yes, yeah. and, and what do you work with scientists? In other projects, so Heather knows more, much more about the science and ecology of places than I do. I was a bit lazy yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one more question for you coming in. Um, so it says, "I love that you can that you see writing and inscriptions in the trails of sea creatures." as I recognize the same thing. Do you see the trails as a kind of language or our conception of a kind of language? And this is from someone who says, I've literally just discovered by some of semiotics and the idea that nature codes and decodes itself. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm keen to find out more. Mm. I would love to le learn more about biosemiotics. That sounds really cool. Um, I see them, I recognize that I'm looking at them and that I'm seeing language because it's what I recognize and know. Um, but I also think that they have their own language and even if it's not a written language. And so I don't know, it's sort of, I know it's a little bit silly, but I think it's a beautiful thing to think about what it would be like to be a snail and <laughs> what they're doing and um, just learn as much about them. So. I think it's I think it's both things. I think it's my human recognition of language and wanting to acknowledge um, another creature at the same time and understand. Mm -hmm. There's a um, there's a word a German word for putting yourself in another creature's umwelt and trying to pretend I don't know imagine what it might be like. <laughs> I think that's 
maybe that's something that's of interest to me. Yeah, that's lovely. I think the person who asked that question, I'm going to put you in touch with after your talk because yeah. I think you have a lot to talk about. Um, yeah, and that person has also just said, "Not silly." I agree. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I've got one one more question for you. Have you considered incorporating the mud into the casting so they look more like their surroundings? Mm. For this project, I'm I'm sort of liking them just as white. Um, the plaster, I think, is fine. I, I kind of wish they were ceramic so they were more durable. But um, but in the past, I did a project where I cast um, the actual mud into um, shells that I collected and made piles of them kind of as a an offering that would like a like a tzatza. Um, so I have I have worked with the mud before in past projects, but um, but yeah, that's a good question. I've heard, I've been learning a lot about um, estuaries. I mean, I've been learning a lot about artists here that have been working with the actual mud. And it's pretty exciting. There's a lot of really great art projects that have, that are local here. People um, firing the clay, working with it, painting with it, printing with the mud. So I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you heather thank yeah. you so much um i think that's everyone's questions um and apologies to people who are online because we're very lucky because heather's here with us in the room and she's going to show us some of her physical stuff in a minute um but that's just for us so thank you so much for doing your talk um i think you know from the way that we've been talking this morning it would be nice to think that you're going to be back next year or the year after and we can have another talk and then you can show people some of the things that you've made while you're here. Um, but in the meantime, thank you. Um, also, Heather will be displaying some of her prints and books that have been made as part of the project um, at, at the library here at some point. So we'll make sure yeah. that- Yeah, can I just say something about that really quick? As part yeah. of the polyvocal sort of um, desire to really connect with people in these landscapes, I've, I. I organized a print exchange and invited artists from Mexico, the US and the UK to just respond to the title of my project in any way they wanted. And Owen and an author in the US wrote essays for them. And so that's what I have with me today to um, display and possibly even leave here. So sounds good to me. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, okay. Heather. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you everybody. See you soon. And yeah, you've got lots of thanks in the chat saying great talk. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.